All right. So good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here today. Uh, we have a whole list of speakers and uh, just some great conversation that we're going to be having, um, you know, in regards to the whole topic of support, don't punish. So welcome again. Um, like I said, we are recording today's session. It will be uploaded to the Mom Stop the Harm YouTube channel when we are completed today. So from there, then I will also be sending out a follow up email to everyone who uh, has registered for today um, with all the links and such of the resources that we will be sharing <clears throat> or that we will be sharing in the uh, chat window. Now, if you have any questions at any point in time, please just pop them into the chat window because we do have a portion of the session set up for doing questions. And so what we do to try to have a little more of a smooth session so everyone can hear what is being asked as well as to uh, hear what answers are coming up. We do ask that if you put it in the in the chat window, then I can collect them afterwards and then we can present them to our speakers and our panel. So if you want to just keep, you know, put them in at any point in time and then we are good to go. So to get us started, I would actually like to um, welcome and introduce uh, Petra Schultz, who is one of the co-founders of Mom Stop the Harm and also on the committee for this project. So please go ahead, Petra. You're on mute though. Thank you, Tyler, and welcome, everybody. Um, to start, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement. Um, we use um, a land acknowledgement that kind of covers all of Turtle Island and some addition, uh, but I um, encourage all of you to just in the chat box, introduce yourself, where you're from, and, um, and your land acknowledgement, if you, um, if you wish. Um, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the traditional ancestral ceded and unceded territories of First Nations people, the Inuit and the Métis, the people that call these lands home. We reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to care for the lands, strengthen our relationships with Indigenous people, and improve our own understanding of their unique histories, homelands, languages, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs. In addition to this land acknowledgement, it's critical that we acknowledge Canada's history of enslavement, racial segregation, and marginalization, as it has had a devastating impact on people of African descent, uh, the Afro-Caribbean and Black communities across the country. Canada has neither recognized nor educated the public adequately, adequately about the historical facts related to slavery and the anti-Black racism it has produced. With this said, I'd like to further acknowledge um, within the context of this collective action that we are engaged in and recognize that we cannot separate the legacy and existence of colonialism, white supremacy from the current crisis of criminalization and incarceration in Canada. And particularly the ways in which criminalization and the criminalization of certain substance and people who use substances disproportionately impacts members of marginalized group, including um, indigenous, black and racialized people, women, girls, gender non-conforming people, members of the um, two as LGBTQIA plus communities, people experiencing poverty, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness and all those whose experiences of oppression exist in the intersection of their multiple social locations and identities. And thank you to our board member, um, Missy McLean from Ontario for crafting this, um, this acknowledgement for us. Um, the, the last paragraph um, is particularly important to me as a, as a mom who um, uh, lost a child and has a living child with um, um, yeah, living experience. Um, who is um, part of a gender gender minority and also with a disability. So it's really, really important that we acknowledge all that. Um, I personally am uh, speaking to you from Amiskwachis, West Kahaiken, uh, which is colonially known as Edmonton um, in, in the Treaty 6 region and home of many Indigenous people, um, uh, yeah, where we are all Treaty people. So thank you very much. We hope to take about 90 minutes for this, depending on how many we don't want to on a beautiful Saturday, we really appreciate that you share your time with us and we um, um, there is 
a uh, limit to the intention span one can keep on Zoom. So we will first give a chance to our speakers to answer some questions. And then um, we will uh, give a, you a chance to ask questions of our speakers. But as Tyler said, just pop those questions right in. And um, we hope to have um, a lively engagement today. And I'm really excited about um, our panel. Oh, um, Tyler or Angela, can someone send the link to Marie, please? Um, so roundtable participants today, uh, we are really excited to introduce to you Lucian Prosti. Lucian is new, uh, well, Willie has known for longer, but he's, he's kind of joined as an ally to our advocacy work. He's a person with lived experience in the foster care system, uh, problematic drug, drug use in, and incarceration. He now lives in Saskatoon. Um, he, he's a musician. Um, he wrote just an amazing blog you can find on our website. And I think that's one of the links Tyler will be popping in. Um, and I'll let him tell more about himself. Um, Willie McCorston is um, a regional director for Saskatchewan with Mom Stop the Harm and the, the mom of a um, young woman who has been involved with the um, justice system uh, because of her substance use disorder. And, and Willie, with um, permission of her daughter, will share more about their experience. Um, Marie Argeridis, also from Saskatoon, will join us uh, shortly here. Um, Marie is one of the original members of Mom Stop the Harm when we started out in 2016. Um, and she's a board vice, vice chair right now. She lost her son Kelly to fentanyl in 2015. And um, as based on that experience, she was one of the people who advocated for the 911 emergency law. And she'll speak more about that. Um, Michelle Cleary, Cleary Hare is um, um, a new uh, member of our uh, board of directors. She is in Newfoundland. Um, and um, Michelle joined us because too many people are dying from unsafe drugs. And um, Michelle will also share the experience of her family and a bit more what's happening in Newfoundland and Labrador. And while we are on that side of the country, um, we have also Dr. Jamie Livingston, who is a criminologist um, and um, a, just a wonderful ally. And Jamie will provide um, the academic, he's at Dalhousie in Halifax, he will provide the academic experience to kind of um, put the personal experiences the other speakers are sharing in context. And talking about context, yesterday the government of Canada released the latest statistics for, um, to, uh, for 2021. And since 2016, since we were keeping now statistics, which doesn't even include my son Danny, for example, who died in 2014, um, we've lost nearly 30,000 people to drug poisoning. Right now, 21 people today in Canada will be planning funerals for people they love. We have families from coast to coast, um, from Corinne in the, on the West Coast um, to Ginny on the East Coast, who every day worry if their child will, will become one of the statistics and they fight and we fight with them to keep these children alive. And a huge impact of the risk that people face is the ongoing criminalization of substance use. Um, the fact that Bill 216, which was before the House of Commons was move, voted down, the fact that there are politicians who feel that we still have to criminalize people use drugs is an important factor uh, why so many people die. So to get us started, um, I'd like to get started um, with, um, with um, Lucien and um, just ask Lucien, um, how has criminalization affected you as an individual with lived experience? Um, if you can uh, share what you feel free to share, we'd, we'd love to hear from you first. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Lucien Brosti. I'm a 40 year old Métis man from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm also a recovering junkie. And uh, well, obviously one of the ways that uh, having drugs criminalized have affected me was made a criminal out of me, right? Like it, uh, you get a criminal record, you go to prison, 
and a lot of people that go to prison well almost all of them they don't come out better anyone who believes that prison rehabilitates usually just needs a job right like prisons don't rehabilitate anyone they turn uh, moderate criminals into serious criminals and it when you when you go to prison sure it gets you off drugs somewhat sometimes for a minute but there there there's no programs and there and csc correction service canada is cutting all program they're cutting everything they want more bars more guards and more cells and that's all the money's for it all the programs that they used to have are all getting cut all the funding's getting cut and they're just warehousing people so i just i just don't see how taking someone who has substance issues and locking them up, like getting, getting someone clean is like a bandaid. You have to get to the trauma that causes addiction in order to really heal it. Right. Like you, you can quit drugs and, and stop doing them. That's the easy part, but healing from the trauma, if you don't heal from it, then it's just going to continue. And like addiction is a cycle. It's also hereditary. And it, it just, it just, it, it, it's such a vicious cycle. And when, when it comes to getting help in, well, in Saskatoon, at least, your options are extremely limited. And uh, the, some of the approaches aren't accepted by some organizations and other approaches aren't recognized by some. So it's, it, it, it's, like, it's like being told 10 different directions at once and they're all telling you to pick that one, but it's just, it's really confusing and it's really intimidating. And there, there's a lot of stigma around getting help too, right? Like if, you, if you're going to get help people assume that you're untrustworthy or that that you're a criminal or or just just the, the typical things you think of when you think of a junkie right like and once once you're able to take away some of that stigma then you can start realizing what the real problems are and and you can work on them that way um in my opinion and this is just my opinion um when it comes to the people who make the decisions on where the money is spent for addictions uh, you should be uh, a recently clean or in recovery uh, addict. Like it, anyone who is deciding what kind of helps addicts should get. And if you've never been an addict yourself, then you've no idea what you're talking about, right? Like it's it, it just, you, you can learn in a classroom for 50 years, but if I've been a junkie for a month, I know more than you. And people who have been there actively are the ones that should be deciding these things and should be giving the input to the people who do decide it, right? And once we are able to remove some of these stigmas and it becomes normalized that hey you know people get addicted to substances and it happens like you, you hurt your leg at work and, and they put you on pain pills and they over prescribe you and then they suddenly cut you off and say good luck and then the fentanyl dealers are waiting down the street because you're sick and you'll do almost anything to get to, for it to stop uh there has to be there has to be a more modern approach and again this is this is just my my opinion NA, uh, NA doesn't apply to fentanyl. It just doesn't. The, the, the only thing that has concrete evidence that is proven to work is Suboxone. Because methadone you can still use while you're on it and Suboxone you can't. And so if I was to go to NA and wanted to start going to meetings and I told them I'm on Suboxone, they would tell me to leave and to come back when I'm ready to take it serious. That kind of attitude kills people. There, there, there is no time for trial and error with fentanyl. Either you get it right the first time or every mistake you make, you're killing people. You're killing people. And now we have in Saskatoon what's called Gucci. We call it Gucci dope. It's a mixture of xylazine and fentanyl. So they're putting benzodiazepines in the dope. So if you overdose on fentanyl and uh, <clears throat> um, someone gives you naloxone, it can't get through the layer of benzodiazepines to get to the fentanyl. So you literally die twice. And it's the most common dope that we find on our streets and people are lining up, lining up. I think this summer alone, and just from June 21st to September 21st, we will see more ODs in Saskatoon than we did in the previous year. And every year since 2012, we've broken OD records every year. And I think it's, it's really shameful that it's going to take the death of the children of one of these people who make the decisions on addicts for there to be real change. Because when you're marginalized, you have no voice and you don't matter. You don't have enough money to compete. You, you, you're just, unless you have the money and the social status here, you're, you're nothing. Uh, we, need to take, we need to take religion out of uh, addiction. Like we need to take religion out of recovery because it intimidates a lot of people. It's 
like it, it, that's it's my my personal opinion it's way too judgmental and that's not what people need when they're trying to come into recovery someone who's been clean for 30 years has nothing in common with someone who's trying to get clean today you're no longer in recovery if you've been clean for 30 years that's na that's na thinking that's that's any thinking you're never better you never you never don't need them you never are on your own and fine you'll always need them and that's it, it just it doesn't apply to fentanyl the the times have changed the drugs have changed just the whole game has changed and every day people are dying and there's less and less help available and it's just going to keep happening until it affects someone who's in the position to make that change because they just don't care. They, they, they don't care. Like they don't care unless, unless you're someone who like, let's say you're a business owner and you contribute money to all these things. Like they just, there, there's rules for people with money and then there's rules for the rest of us. Right. And because of those rules, people are dying. Our kids are dying. Like just, just this year alone, it's, it's 2022. I've lost nine friends, eight to ODs, and one who got shot by the police in Winnipeg last Friday. And it, it's, I'm getting really sick of burying my friends. Um, I, I just, I don't, the way things are going, there, there's no end in sight. There's no end in sight, and it's not going to get any better. And people are just going to keep dying and dying and dying and dying. And until someone gives a shit and does something about it and starts banding together, and, and and trying to make a positive change that will not only not only be valid and 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 accepted but it has to it has to catch on like it has to catch on you know like people have to understand that if you get addicted to drugs there's nothing to be ashamed about because it happens and there is help for you and and you have options because if any isn't for you then maybe this is for you and if that's not for you maybe this is for you you have to present options to people besides uh, the cult of NA or a prison cell. There has to be more. Like there just has to be more. And we're, 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 we're going in circles, especially here in Saskatoon, like uh, Prairie Harm Reduction, our safe injection site, um, has had their funding denied every time they've asked for it. And it's because the people in power are privileged, wealthy, white, usually religious, and, and we need to, to, to get those kinds of people out and put it in the hands of, of people who have been there and know exactly how hard it is to, to try and find help and know about the obstacles that they face when they're trying to, to, to overcome addiction and, and things like that. And our, 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 prisons, our prisons aren't rehabs and they shouldn't be, you know, like it, it's rehab is a huge business and there is no money in you being recovered. There's money in you in recovery, right? We need to start focusing on what happens once you have enough clean time in and how to recover from that, right? Because other than that, you're, you're constantly told that, that you're powerless and weak to stop your addiction and you'll never do it on your own. And no matter what you do, you're going to fail. So you got to put your faith in God or you got to put your faith in the system. And both of them have let us down time and time again. Um, my heart goes out to all you mothers who have lost children. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father and a grandfather myself and I couldn't imagine and I got down on my knees when I was an addict and prayed to the same God you did. And he didn't show up. So what now? What do we do now? What, what is there that we can do going forward that is going to, to make a difference in this absolute epidemic that we're in? Like this is an epidemic. This is people are dying in bulk. It's, it's mass murder at the hands of drug dealers. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and there is so much dope here and it just you're seeing in the news almost every week about a huge bus with massive amounts of weight guns and just nobody 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 cares we're left to fend to our own devices and the 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 amount of support that people have is is non-existent and there there's just no way out and it, it, it just it, it's not going to get better unless people start giving a shit like People just have to give a shit and it has to go more than just saying you do. A anyone can make a post saying they support you, but unless they actually get up and do something about it, it's just words, right? Talk is cheap. Um, your actions speak louder and that's why it's so quiet, right? Like it, it just, it, you don't, people don't understand what it's like to be an addict. So they just write it off. Oh, it doesn't affect me. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I'm fine. Then they get hurt at work and now they're on OxyContin and then two weeks later taking your pills as directed, you're now addicted and your doctor 
because now that you're addicted to something and you say that you're addicted, that puts you in a different category. Now you're a junkie when before you were just someone who was following doctor's orders, but now you're, now you're stigmatized because you followed those doctor's orders and then they punish you by cutting you off your pills. And now, now you have to go to the street and, and you're, you're, who knows what you're getting. There needs to be more drug testing sites. There needs to be, there, there's so many things that, that could easily happen here. And it just, they just won't, it just, they won't do it because to them, junkies are a waste of money. Lucien, you speak powerfully and uh, um, what you share is what, what many people here have experienced. Can you explain a little bit how, in your case, how being in jail, being criminalized, um, uh, what specific effect that, that has had on you, that element? Yeah, um, I, I've never I've never been to jail for drugs. I've never been arrested for drugs, but I've been to the federal penitentiary. I've been to the correctional. I've spent about eight years of my life in and out of jail. And, and it was usually for for like, you know, violence or like thefts and things like that. And it, 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 it affected me in, in, in quite a few ways, because one, it made a lot of problems getting employment. Uh, to you're, you're you're stuck to like conditions and things like that you can't leave you got to be in and out it, it, it's a system that's literally designed for you to fail like that's what that's what it's for that their incarceration is also a business and uh, and i won't be surprised when they privatize prisons in canada too but uh it, it puts such a roadblock and it's like this big red stamp on your forehead that as soon as people see it, they're intimidated by it because it's something they don't know anything about. They've never been affected by it. They just know what they see on TV or in music or magazines or whatever it is they're looking at. And, and there's, there's like going to prison, you think someone will get help, but there is no help. There's no help in prison. There's nothing for you. There's a cell and a bunch of gangsters that want to sell you drugs. They got whatever you want. And it, it, it's, it's, it's warehousing. And like I said before, anyone who believes that uh, prison rehabilitates probably just needs a job. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get back to you as we get going in our discussion. I'm quite sure there are members in the audience too who will have a question. Um, next, uh, Willie will share with us from the family perspective of how this system has affected um, her daughter and her family. So over to you, Willie. Thanks, Lucien. That was really good. Just trying to collect myself here a little bit. Um, so yeah, my, my daughter uh, originally began using uh, prescribed uh, benzodiazepines for anxiety. She uh, had uh, issues with anxiety and depression and major migraine headaches from the time she was quite young, um, probably four or five years old. So, um, yeah, so she went to the doctor and, and they gave her some benzodiazepines and uh, when she was probably only about 12. Um, and of course, at that time, we just thought, well, the doctor knows what they're doing. Um, and uh, anyway, we soon learned that uh, she couldn't function without them. And so she couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't go to school very effectively. And, you know, we tried to deal with those things. Um, I was reaching out all over the place for mental health help, um, that kind of thing. And we just didn't find it. I went to the university in Saskatoon, got a psych ed sec assessment done, you know, paid, paid for it because I was happy if we could get the information. Um, but having the information didn't really help us find solutions. So uh, anyway, ultimately her, um, her need for a substance to make her feel like you can be alive in this world um, led to the underworld as as Lucien says when they stop giving you medical supply then you go and you you find whatever will make you feel better um, she also had a, a friend whose mother um, was being given um, uh, oxy uh, pretty much like candy they were handing it out you know pretty easily to people and uh, this mother also had some medical issues. And so uh, the son, who was my daughter's friend and her, they, they soon figured out that, you know, their mom would just give them these pills. She, she didn't, you know, she'd been told they weren't addictive and everything was fine. So she turned her own son and my daughter into uh, people who needed her pills. And so, so anyway, um, you know, when that supply dried up, 
um, again, you know, you go where you can find it, as Lucienne said. So, and then next thing you know, uh, you know, the 80s showed up. And so it wasn't oxy, it was now fentanyl. And so my daughter ended up addicted to fentanyl and benzodiazepines at the same time. It's really a miracle that she is still here. Um, but when you come to the criminality of all of this, um, you know, she just had to do what she had to do. And she was a very young girl. And, uh, you know, she found people who uh, wanted to have a young girl around and that they could influence. And so, you know, she ended up um, living in a, a drug house and, uh, and they got busted. And, you know, small town, uh, very small town that we live in. Um, there's one of the great harms of, of this for us was complete loss of privacy. Um, you know, in a small town like this, of course, everybody knows everybody else's business, but um, it's something I'm mindful of now because I, while I try to tell her story, I do try to honor her privacy. Um, and I try to honor the privacy of everyone who's been criminal justice involved because we lose that and somehow it really does feel like a violation. So my daughter served time in Pine Grove Correctional in Saskatoon, which is a women's prison and also in uh, EIFW in Edmonton. So as Lucienne says, we did not find rehab in, in these prisons. Uh, my daughter is quite honest when she says if we hadn't got her on methadone before she went to jail, she would have had nothing while she was in there. And that would have inevitably led to her probably using in jail. And uh, we know where that easily could have led to. So um, the fact that uh, she, survived the prison experience was in large part due to the fact that she was already on an opioid agonist therapy and, and they couldn't take it away because she'd been on it before she went. So um, I'm a changed person. I used to really believe that we needed our criminal justice system and I am now an abolitionist. And I think in very few cases that we need to put people in jail. Um, so I do my work um, with that in mind. That, that ultimately we need to figure out better ways, as Lucienne says. And uh, I'm very thankful for all of the Mom Stop the Harm family and especially uh, Marie, because she really reached out to me when things were really bad. And uh, we need to save each other. And I think that's the message here is the system isn't gonna help us, so. We have to do this our own. So, so thank you everyone for listening and really thank you for coming. And uh, if you have a passion for justice advocacy, uh, we do have a new group. Um, you can look us up on Facebook and uh, we'd love to have you. Um, there's certainly power in numbers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie, for, for sharing. And I, we all know how, how hard this is, how, how deeply personal and um, I'm, I'm so thankful that um, that you're with us, that, you, that you're fighting for this, um, that your daughter came through all this. Um, it really gives us, um, it gives us hope. And um, yeah, uh, Willie already mentioned Marie. Marie was uh, one of our founding directors, not a co-founder right from the start, but one of the founding directors of Mom Stop the Harm. And um, from her experience, she was instrumental in getting us what I call a, a small piece of decriminalization in Canada. And um, Marie will speak to this and maybe also touch on what, how effective it is right now and what more we can, we can do. So over to you, Marie. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, good morning, all. Um, I have to admit, I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is comfort R us. Um, so yeah. I also hail from Saskatoon, um, Lucian. Uh, when I hear your story, it all resonates because I have, I lost a son, we lost a son in 2015 to an opioid poisoning, it was fentanyl, and another one we nearly lost, but thank goodness today he is managing his, his addictions well and managing his life as to the best that he can for now. So I'm grateful for that. So when my son passed away, um, well, first of all, the older boy, started uh, using prescription medications, diverted prescription medications in grade 12. Um, headaches, whatever, recreational. Nonetheless, it led him down the path, ultimately heroin. 
then he started the methadone program in, in actually it was 2011 when he started using uh, prescribed uh, prescribed opiates. And then in 2014, he started the methadone program. And, you know, that was up and down, up and down. Um, but then in 2015, his little brother ended up dying. And it, it was so, it blew me away so much because having the little brother, having seen exactly what we've gone through as a family, exactly the hardship his older brother had gone through um, being in, you know, going from a top end student with a whole lot going for him to this really horrifying, horrible life um, and, and just desperate. So to have Kelly die uh, blew me away. I, 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 it didn't make any sense. So that started me on the journey that I'm on. So, and when Kelly had passed away, he was uh, at home and he had a friend here. And when he died, the friend was um, too afraid to call 911. He, he thought that, you know, he had, if he had drugs, so he kept phoning his father because Kelly had taken, snorted half of a pill, laid down on our sofa. We were away for the weekend. Kelly was 19. He had laid down on the sofa to have a little nap after <coughs> taking half of something. What he, you know, uh, whether he thought it was fentanyl at the time or whether he knew it was fentanyl and it was a, a, um, an illicit black market pill or whether he thought it was Oxycontin, I guess I'll never know. I hear both sides of that story. However, um, his friend was too call, afraid to call 911, kept phoning his father. By the time he got through to his dad, um, the father called 911, but it was much too late for Kelly. And of course, the kid's fear was that there were evidence of drugs in the room and he didn't want to um, put himself in a position. And you can get that fear. I understand that fear. And it was a fear created by society. So with a little bit of advocacy and um, a lot of a lot of uh, going on to media, I talked to anybody who would talk to me about it. I ended up getting um, a senator in Ottawa reached out to me and asked if I would share my story in the Senate in Ottawa because they, they were looking at the um, Overdose Protection Act, the 911 law. And so I see there's two times actually, no, that was the change to the Controlled Substance Act. We were part of that one too in the Senate. The second, the other one was, um, it was a, a, a backbencher actually brought a bill forward. A BC backbencher brought a bill forward in Ottawa. If you know anything about politics, backbenchers bringing a bill forward that, that they rarely get heard on the floor and they rarely get anybody to pass anything. It's politics are so political. Um, so we told our stories, another woman and I in Canada about what's happened to our children. And it, came, it brought, it brought um, the need for something, the law to change so that our kids weren't afraid to call 911. And, and our kids weren't dying just like, how ridiculous to have a child die, to have a loved one die because you're too afraid of prosecution you know, how, how outrageous was that? Ultimately, it was heard, the law passed, Kelly's story was told, another woman from the, the um, east coast of Canada, or the Toronto area, her son's story was also told. And, you know, God bless this woman, or universe bless her, she lost another son this year. Anyhow, um, you know, you know, and I thought of all the things that had to happen, you know, Kelly's death, you, you want to assign something you know, how can you take something and find something positive out of, out of the death of a child? Um, but I, I also began to believe that, you know, our kids who who passed had a greater calling. Um, and this was part of it. And their parents and the people out there trying to make a change. Um, and, you know, one other real quick story I'll tell you. It wasn't six months ago during the middle of COVID, a young man came to my door. And I was afraid to answer it because, you know, home alone. So I tried to tell this kid I had COVID and he goes, oh, it's me. And he pulled his mask down. It's a friend of my son's from high school. And he came in the house. So let him in. He told me the story of how he never used those drugs and that how he about a year ago was in a desperate place and had a couple of the buddies that were still using them came in. He said, give me some. He used it promptly. Um, he promptly overdosed. And the kid that was with him pulled him out of the truck and started called 911 and gave him CPR. And he said that uh, it was that overdose protection act that saved his life. And I just felt, you know, it came full circle because Kelly's death, in fact, served to save the life of one of his pals, one of his best friends in high school. So um, that's all we can do. We can just keep on trying. And, and how do we, how do we, and, and the police too, in the act itself, um, basically they can't shake you down for your drugs uh, if you're in a room with somebody and they overdose. And I, you know, in Saskatoon, for the most part, 
Um, it's the old school officers we might have the trouble with, but the younger ones are fairly, uh, they're good with it. We haven't heard that much, that, that, that much, that many problems with it. Um, however, that's the story. Um, all thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Um, I always, um, if I think about if if I think about Kelly and how a phone call could have saved his life, um, uh, it is really amazing what you have done, what you have have helped do. And it's a small piece of decrim, and we can see it work, but we know it's it's not enough. But it, and thankful that we have it, and it saved the the life of Kelly's friend. Um, next, I'd like to call on uh, Michelle. Um, and Claire here to speak. Michelle is a new director um, from Newfoundland. Um, as we know, this crisis has been moving across the country as politicians stick their head in the sand and as our kids are um, incarcerated or dying, um, we see more and more provinces effective and we are really thankful to have Michelle and her team out in Newfoundland um, as our voice. So Michelle, over to you. Hi, can everybody hear me? Oh, I'm, I'm usually techno technologically savvy at work, but uh, anyway, I had to switch computers here today. So if you let have any issues hearing me, normally when I speak, they can hear me down the road. So that's my teacher's voice sometimes. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be uh, here today and uh, Thank you to Lucien and uh, Willie, I believe, yes, for speaking. Uh, and both of you made me tear up. So thanks for that. Uh, that's happening a lot lately. Um, I have three beautiful daughters and uh, uh, smart, funny, intelligent. Um, yeah. I, I hope to go for a fourth until husband said no when he was getting snipped. So I might have had four or five. But anyway, I was blessed with three. And... Uh, my oldest daughter uh, is probably the one who hear, wears her heart on her sleeve the most. You know, she was, uh, she is the, the, you know, in school, she was the student who wasn't the top in any of the sports, but played on everything, wasn't the top academically, but hung around with everybody, um, brought home stray cats and kittens and people. And, um, you know, she just, she was the student in school who everybody knew, you know, whether you were in the, um, whatever class you were in, let's just say, you know, she knew your name and uh, took time for you. And around grade 11, 12, um, she's 32 now, um, she started dating a young fella whose mom um, had cancer and she had a lot of drugs for pain. And um, my husband spoke up and said he didn't want her hanging around with them. And he heard more than I did, I guess. And I, me being in the school system hadn't heard as much as I should. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I spoke to him and her friends came and said, you know, he's great and he's a nice guy and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, her friends, most of the friends that she hung around with in high school then they're engineers today, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're nurses, you know, they work at Walmart. She had a wide variety of friends, uh, you know, and she did go to university. Um, she still two courses from getting her arts degree. Uh, she wanted to be a social worker, but anyway, uh, she started using, she was introduced to Percocet in high school and that led to trying Oxy uh, that the young man got from, stole from his mother who was, who was ended up dying from cancer. And uh, anyway, you know, it's been a long, I'll say 10 years from, with the fact that without going into any details, I have, you know, we had intervention early on when I heard about the Percocet. Um, she just then went from one young man to another um, who was, involved with drugs in one form or the other. Like if she broke up with young, one young fella and all of them, you know, were for a varied period of years. Um, I had them in my home. I think I liked every one of them, to be honest, probably except the first boyfriend, but uh, who introduced her to Percocet, but he's, cause he's still in, you know, hard shape, but he's alive. Anyway, um, 
it went to the point where, you know, we went into where she was going to university and ended up taking her home when I found some needles in her room. And then I said, wow. And, and, and actually it even goes back to missing spoons for you mothers here who might be familiar with that. We just couldn't figure out where our spoons were going. And God, we were using a lot of big spoons. And sometimes they'd leave them out by the bus stop she would or the kids would take yogurt with them. But then to make a long story short, we know we ended up finding out what she was doing with the spoons. And um, throughout the years, uh, early years, it, it just progressed from her ending up having, you know, us having to find her another place to live. You know, she couldn't stay with us. Um, she was, you know, living, you know, in, in shelters for a while, um, probably couch surfing. Uh, and she's been incarcerated uh, several times. So the first time she was incarcerated for five months, she was on methadone. Uh, she was also pregnant, we found out once she got in, in prison um, and had her baby. Um, she was in, we have a women's prison here in Clarenville called uh, just Clarenville Women's Set Prison. And we also have Her, Magister, Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's, which is the male prison. The, at first, the first time she was incarcerated and in prison out there, I really did believe that prison saved her life. I, I you know, I, I feel that, and I, I don't know if I could change that now. I, 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 think, I think maybe for me and my husband, we thought at that time, and the women's prison is pretty different here in Newfoundland, usually, you know, 22, maybe 22 people, you know, they had a couple of programs going on there. And um, because I was so involved with her life, they treated her fairly well. They knew me. Uh, I visited her twice a week. I, um, once she had the baby, I took the baby home. I visited with the baby twice a week. So they well knew who I was and um, they still do. And um, I think that helped her treatment. Um, but I mean, she was incarcerated with, um, for stealing checks and writing checks and actually stealing for me and um, a company I had and, uh, you know, putting the checks into businesses in the area and to buy drugs. And that was the reason for doing that. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a... We have a couple of wonderful organizations in St. John's, Newfoundland, and, and a little bit throughout the province that, you know, they, uh, they visit, Stella Circle visits the prison in Clarenville at least once a week, but they have no full-time addictions counselor. And so she had no, no real counseling at all because she had little bits and pieces because, you know, she could see the counselor maybe an hour a week if, you know, and they did have some group med meetings when Stella Circle came out. Um, if, for example, while she was in prison, they were low on staff, they were locked in their cells, uh, could be all day, they rarely would get outside. Um, so I would call in and fight and argue about that, you know, that, you know, her mental health would be worse if they weren't going to fix that. Um, and I'd call right up the chain, you know, right to the Minister of Justice. Uh, you, you know, I was, I've never really been afraid to do that. And I found out that in order to keep her as healthy as I could while she was in prison, um, that I had to do that. I, I had to make sure they knew who I was. Anyway, um, she's been in, that was her first time. Um, that was almost six years ago, six years ago, six and a half years ago. And she's been incarcerated since then. And she's also been put in Her Majesty's, Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's for a little bit uh, in the women's room that they had. Um, this, the Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's does have a full-time addictions counselor and why they don't have one in the Clarenville prison, just, I don't know, nobody I know who I asked that question to has an answer for me, including, you know, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Education or the Minister of Health. Um, so I guess what I'd like to say is that I used to believe I, I think in the, the first time jail probably saved her life and the times that she has been incarcerated those three or four times, um, I might have, I, I, I won't lie to you. Um, I won't lie to you. I, I, you know, we probably slept the best in our life, believe it or not, when she was in jail. 
we knew where she was. She had a meal, you know, she had some snacks. She had her many, quite often had her own cell. Um, but she was also in, you know, incarcerated with people accused of murder uh, who went on to, you know, life in prison. And that was very, very scary. And, um, but the majority of people that my daughter was incarcerated with were those who had stolen um, and gotten themselves in trouble for stealing money or stealing whatever they could to pay for their drug habit. And is that criminal? It is criminal, but do, is jail the right place for them? No, uh, no, it definitely isn't. Uh, at one point, uh, when she was here with us and she was detoxing at home, that was early on when I didn't know much, although I'd read as much as I could. Um, she tried, she had planned to jump out the bedroom, the bathroom window. And um, so we took her that night and took her into our um, mental health uh, hospital in St. John's. And by two o'clock in the morning, while she was sitting next to the psychiatrist who you actually, as we, you know, you really wouldn't have known who the psychiatrist was because she's so smart. My daughter is so smart. And anyway, they sent her home and said she wasn't in any mental health crisis, even though the government has now linked mental health crisis and addiction together services. Um, yeah, so she wasn't in any mental health crisis, although if she had jumped out my window, she probably would have hit something by the bottom of the window that probably would have impaled her. And she still would have jumped knowing what was there. So over the last number of years of her being in jail, me being her surety, uh, twice last year after having her in jail, um, and she was, you know, then she would start to tell me that, you know, there were some drugs getting into even the women's, Clar you know, the women's prison in Clarenville. Um, there was no treatment, no help for her, no counseling. Um, and especially last summer, they were sh so short on staff that, um, you know, they were locked in their rooms so often that I knew I came to understand completely, to be honest, that this was not the right place for her. And if there was anything I could do, um, you know, teaching her that lesson that, yeah, you, you know, you stole for drugs, you de deserve to be in jail. And you know what, uh, people, a lot of my family thought that's where she deserved to be. Like, if you ever want to really learn about love and family, you have a child who, who steals for drugs and is incarcerated because it's eye-opening and not, a, I don't know if any ed education in the world will change their view on that, but, and that's having someone they know and love uh, in the system. So I learned a lot from that as well. And I learned that unless I help and speak up for her, then nothing in this province was going to change. And uh, Christmas time here passed. We had three overdoses in our, my small community of Harbor Grace, two in Harbor Grace and one in Carboneer. And if those young people, two of them were saved by naloxone and people um, uh, calling for help for them. And the other young man who I taught many years ago and uh, just a year older than my daughter, and he used to do drugs with her as well, he died. And he was living with his grandmother who was 80 something years old. And he died, and he, I can tell you, he was working away back and forth and uh, did the drugs in his own bedroom. And, you know, if he had a safe place to use, he'd probably be alive because I can tell you he didn't want to die. And he was loved. So, anyway, the uh, justice system in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, I mean, they, there's been a, a five year plan here for the last, it just ended about three months ago where they have a plan in place for how they're going to deal with, uh, who is going to deal with addictions, whether it's gonna be mental health, um, the health department or justice. So they are trying to move it away from justice. But uh, recently I was on a, in an interview with um, uh, another member of uh, our advocacy group through Mom Stop the Harm, Mary, uh, who lost a son to, uh, to uh, poison drugs. Um, and they, she had uh, the CBC host had a couple of other really good speakers on. And since then, I've learned that we do have a lot of people in different places. And uh, we have a lot of people in our, you know, who are working, who want to have uh, safe use sites. Um, but it, there did, still doesn't seem to be an umbrella. And um, I will say, Petra, as well, that recently I'm, I'm always, always 
Every other day, I am sharing some posts, mostly for Mom Stop the Harm, um, with the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Education. And um, I had a response the other day, of a, and somebody came, one of them came back and said, you know, call the office, send us the proper email, and we might sit down and chat with you. So that is not something I would want to do myself, one of our ministers, because I would want somebody really better versed than me to do that with us as well in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I would just like to say that in, in from my opinion, um, I really appreciated uh, what Lucian had to say because my daughter talks to me, she's here with me now. Um, twice last year, I took her out as her surety and twice, once I had to turn her back in because she just would not comply with anything, she wasn't ready. And then I took her out again shortly after that and then the police do do their checks. And when they checked one night at 10 o'clock, she wasn't back and she was supposed to be back at nine. So the, then they put out an arrest warrant for her and she was back strong, worse than the drugs again. And so recently she got incarcerated again. Um, and I was actually hoping for that because I could not reach her. I could not get to her. I mean, I've gone into drug dealers homes and taken her out. I have no fear, none whatsoever. Um, had some threats made towards me. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't care. I I just don't care um, about and, about them. And sorry, Michelle, to be cutting in. You 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 you're a very powerful voice, strong advocate for for your your daughter. And, Thank you. Uh, um, I thought maybe we could hear from Jamie because what I'm interested as well. You know what? Um, one thing we are aware of in Mom Stop the Harm that we and our kids, uh, the privilege that that many of us have. You know that your voice, Marie's voice, um, I don't know if Lucian, maybe you can share in chat if there was somebody advocating on your behalf when you were, um, um, when you were incarcerated. But I'd like to hear from, from Jamie, kind of what you've heard this morning from the families and from Lucian, um, how does that, um, yeah, how would you put that in context with what um, your research and the literature and such tells us what um, the issues are with incarcerating people who use drugs? So doc, Dr. Jamie, we call him Dr. Jamie for fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for that, Petra. And thanks for everyone for, for sharing and about your experiences. And uh, oh boy, I don't know even where to begin to put stuff in context because I, I, I don't necessarily know that it needs to be put in context. So my research is, uh, and all research is with people. And um, so much of what Lucien had shared, for example, um, connects really, really strongly with what I hear when I, so my, my work um, as a criminologist, I work with people who have, um, been uh, detained in like forensic psychiatric hospitals as well as spent time in jails and prisons often repeatedly have uh, routine and regular contact with the police and, and all of it is um, tied into um, issues with poverty, um, issues with substances, including the criminalization of substances, um, as well as um, often tied into other sorts of inequities uh, connected to race and um, and being indigenous and and all sorts of other other things. So um, I think I can only really confirm what the other speakers, the other um, speakers were saying about um, how criminalization uh, contributes to uh, stigma. And I think Lucien touched on this really well in relation, I think, you, I think you described it as being like a red stamp on your forehead and um, making you feel kind of um, less than and devalued and, and all of that sort of thing and uh, placed into separate categories. And really uh, criminalization it kind of confirms the types of things that people were, were talking about around stigma that people were, um, creates kind of a formal label that someone is is uh, devalued, untrustworthy, um, violent, dangerous. Um, and all of that gets internalized as shame and secrecy and avoidance. And that can lead to uh, 
uh, someone mentioned the underground, so <laughs> lead lead to people finding finding friends and connections with others who feel similarly, um, and and then that kind of creates a pattern of of risk factors for further criminal criminal behavior um, because you find a, a network of people who also are alienated and devalued from from society. Um, and all of this kind of invites the criminal justice system into your lives uh, repeatedly. So please contact um, uh, can be routine. So like uh, the police stopping people, confiscate, confiscating um, uh, drugs, but also other things surrounding drugs, uh, searching, strip searching, and all of that sort of thing. And that's kind of routine for people who use drugs. So I recently, and Petra, I shared a book chapter, recently co-wrote a book chapter that I was invited to write about around the stigma of substance use disorders. And I thought, well, I don't, I mean, I know the research, but the people who live it know it better than I do. And I think Lucienne spoke to this as well. And so I know people who have had um, long histories of substance use issues, and some of them continue to have those issues, and uh, people who've had repeated contact with the criminal justice system, including um, being incarcerated in many of the institutions that um, the, the previous uh, speakers mentioned. And so I, th I thought they were really po well positioned to talk about the six stigma of substance use disorders. And so we co-wrote a book chapter together that was recently published, and it hit on all the all the points that were that were mentioned previously. Um, Lucien, I'm sorry to hear about your friend in in Winnipeg, but you know the police violence um, and uh, violent interactions with the police in ways that um, <clears throat> violate people's um, human rights and privacy, as well as um, introduce lots of coercion um, and uh, trauma into their lives um, is routinely experienced um, by people who use drugs. Um, and that's because of, of criminalization. Um, but also um, being in and out of jails and prisons is also a very common experience. And lots of people already spoke about how harmful that can be for people because the help isn't within our prisons often. Um, but the drugs are, <laughs> and um, often people um, pick up really useful skills in relation to escalating their drug use, um, but also have to use drugs in very harmful ways that are conducive to all sorts of health hazards. Um, so the spread of hepatitis and, and HIV, as well as other sorts of health hazards that happen within our prisons and then are exported when they're released into prisons. Um, and when people are released, um, and, uh, and acquire a criminal record that causes all sorts of problems, of course, for people to get jobs, for people to get um, go into college programs that require like um, on the job training or, or job placements. And um, all of the conditions that are attached to people while they're on probation and parole around abstinence um, further criminalize people and, and uh, interrupt their lives in all sorts of ways. And um, Lucien and others have mentioned that the system, I think Lucien used directly said the system is set up for people to fail. And that's often what I hear as well when I talk to people who've been criminalized and have experienced the criminal justice system is that um, on their way out of prison, it's, um, the correctional officers say that we'll hold a, hold a cell open for you or, or that sort of thing. So there's this, this, this kind of impression that <clears throat> that there's not the opportunities to succeed after someone served their time um, and um, that the programs, not only are they not available in prison, but they're not available in the community as well. And I forget who it was. Um, I think the second speaker might have been Willie, but um, said something to along the lines of the, of the, the system won't help us, so we have to help each other. And I think that's really, really important as well, that kind of collective help. And I know Mom Stop the Harm is, is all about that. Um, I'm part of a group here locally um, called the Seventh Step Society of Nova Scotia. It's a group of people, um, half are volunteers, half are people who have like repeated involvement in the criminal justice system. 
most of, of um, our folks also have mental health and substance use issues. And it's really about collectively supporting one another because there's nothing else. Um, there's no other place where people can share their stories and, and get support in ways that don't place them at risk for being, uh, being pulled back into the criminal justice system, but also provide kind of a non-judgmental non space for people to share about their, their challenges, which is really, really lacking, is, and especially for people who use drugs. Um, and the criminalization of drugs kind of fosters that context in which people don't have others to share with. Um, and, and folks on this call know more, more than most people about the, the harms um, related to people feeling like they have, um, that they're alone and that they have to use alone because of the risks associated with that. And that contributes to the 21 people a day dying um, from, from drug poisoning. So, so I don't know. I I I I hope that was a little, little bit helpful. But but really, it was just to confirm everything that people were saying, and that it's re reflected in the research, and that um, criminalization is intended to solve problems. Um, but we know from the research, and we know from what people have just shared, um, that it um, it actually causes um, and exacerbates harms in in many different ways. Um, and really solves very few problems um, uh, and really just places people like uh, exacerbate social and health risks that are tremendously damaging for people who use drugs, for families, for, for friends and loved ones, as well as for broad, broader society by um, draining resources from what we know to be effective to mitigate risks associated with, with, with drugs. Um, but, but draining those resources and using law enforcement strategies that we know are really ineffective for mitigating anything and, um, and that sort of thing. And, and having said that, we know that all of this is intensified for people who are racialized and people who are indigenous and people who occupy other uh, oppressed groups. So police harassment, police interactions, um, we know that our, our, um, our jails and prisons are disproportionately filled with people who are black and especially people who are indigenous um, and especially for indigenous women who are overrepresented within our prisons. So all of these harms are just intensified for people who experience other forms of marginalization who, who don't have those types of privileges that you were mentioning. Uh, Petra, that I think that was the original question, but um, that's what we see in in, in the research, um, and in, in, and we see that when we speak to people as well. Thank you for that, Jamie. And now uh, we have time to take questions from the audience, but also from the panel. I know um, uh, Willie um, uh, uh, has a has a question or a comment at that point, and then Tyler, maybe you want to take over after Willie and uh, give us some some audience questions. Hi, thanks, Dr. Jamie. I know we're running short on time, but I just wondered if you maybe wanted to talk for a minute about the Iron Law of Prohibition from a from your standpoint. Um, I, I think it's something that deserves a lot more discussion and doesn't happen enough. So I just wondered if you might have a minute to talk about that. Sure, it's kind of a, a formula, <laughs> if you will. Um, around that the most, the more that law enforcement efforts intensify and we invest more heavily in law enforcement efforts, um, the more risks that are created through, through that um, because uh, people who produce drugs need to adapt. Um, so, so and, and they create drugs that are more powerful and um, can also be more risky and dangerous um, and also uh, less predictable for people who, who buy and consume drugs. Um, and so that's the, the shorthand, the iron law of prohibition, that when you see um, the police cracking down and posting these pictures about all these seizures and that sort of thing, that's really done in a very performative type of way that's uh, political um, and also cultural and social to appease people who feel that's solving something when in fact it's actually 
producing a lot of harms. And research that has looked at this has actually um, shown a significant association between investing in law enforcement efforts and increasing violence. Um, so where you invest more heavily in law enforcement, you see an escalation of violence, um, including homicides in, in those ty types of jurisdictions. And, um, and so that's kind of borne out when you speak to people. Um, I'm sure people observe this, but it's also um, kind of um, uh, borne out in the criminological literature as well as other, other, other research. Um, so it's a it's a it's a well known kind of concept um, that's uh, that's really useful to kind of combat these these law enforcement um, propaganda um, because it's actually uh, quite harmful and it's the the opposite of what needs to be done in, in order to make our communities safer. Um, we need to be investing in communities and community based solutions as opposed to um, funding the police. And I think you mentioned the abolition. So like that's kind of what defunding initiatives and, and abolition and decarceration movements are all about is, is, to, is to recognize the harms of investing so much in law enforcement and, and to reallocate that money elsewhere where we know it's more effective. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you for that, Jamie. And we all love your shirt, especially those of us in Alberta. I support SES in Alberta. <laughs> well, from, from when Jamie helped us out with the horrible um, SES report here. But uh, Tyler, what do we have for questions from our audience? And thank you everybody for the wonderful comments. You've, you've shared so many experiences in your comments. I encourage everyone to take a look at the comments with what's been shared and, and the support that is happening. Actually, we've had um, a whole lot more comments than questions come forward. Um, we did have one question come forward and it was directed to Lucien. I'm not sure if he, I know he had made a, um, posted that his phone was dying. So I'm not sure if he's still with us or not, but I think maybe our other speakers can speak to it as well. So is what is your perspective on drug dealers who are often selling drugs that they themselves don't know the content of the drugs? Sorry, Tyler, can you repeat that? For sure. And actually, Michelle, I'm just going to have you, if you, if it's possible, could you tilt your camera down a little bit? We just more, there, now I see your whole face. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right. So the question is, what is your perspective on our drug dealers who are often selling drugs that they themselves don't know the content of the drugs? Um, I, I would like to respond to that. Um, first of all, um, it seems to be a given, even here in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, and from my conversations with the RCMP and others, and from my daughter, that we are being told here, there are no safe drugs on the street. There is, I recently spoke to a young man who, uh, you know, I saw meth stuff on his table. Um, he told me that he had some fentanyl strips and everything he checked had fentanyl. Every single thing he had that he was selling or had purchased for himself had fentanyl and they were using anyway. So it's coming from, my daughters told me the same thing. They know that everything that they're purchasing from the drug dealers here is, is possibly tainted. Um, we can, they can access some fentanyl strips. They are trying their best to do those. And, but everything that they're testing is showing up some fentanyl, but it doesn't tell them how much. So it shows fentanyl, doesn't show them how much. Um, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, what we're hearing is that the user, people who are using drugs, um, recreationally or otherwise, um, know that the drugs are tainted and are using anyway. So that's where it comes to a safe supply site. Personally, that's why I think there needs to be a safe supply site where people who are going to use can use safely. And uh, as it happened in BC, there was no, you know, while they were using in safe sites, there were no, uh, over, no there were overdoses, but nobody died. And, um, you know, the drug dealers are not going anywhere and they know that all the drugs that they're buying for the most part are somewhat tainted. Um, uh, and unless they're making it themselves or whatever, then they're not clean. 
Um, I'd also like to speak to that question from the perspective of our board um, and Mom Stop the Harm as an organization. We are co-signatory um, to a document that is called Decrim Done Right. I'll find it in a second and, and pop it in here. Um, and uh, in that document, uh, 20 plus organizations from across Canada and endorsed by over 100 organizations, we worked and defined on how decriminalization should look like for us. And um, one thing we discovered is that um, uh, we can't, um, like, who is a drug dealer? Um, we really in that question. And what I have come to learn, learning more from Danny's friends and also from my oldest, um, Millie and such, that almost any one of us whose loved ones, loved one was or is using, um, under the criminal current criminal code in Canada would have been considered a dealer, a so-called dealer, because uh, you know people buy for somebody and share. They pick something up. Uh, they share with somebody who's in distress because they're they're in withdrawal. Um, they 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 sell to to be able to afford their own use. Um, um, they sell because we cut off employment option, like you, you, Lucien said earlier, um, you lose the opportunity to earn a living once you have a criminal record. So in that document, decrim done right, um, in decriminalization, we feel we are adamant, we don't just feel, we are adamant that what we call subsistence trafficking, which is trafficking to keep yourself alive and keep yourself supplied, and social trafficking, which means sharing with my friend when they are in, in withdrawal or picking up for somebody. Or if I, if I live rurally and I drive 100 kilometers to pick something up, maybe I get something for some, that that needs to be considered in the decriminalization. Now, if we would move forward and actually legally regulate uh, substances, and I, I, I always say not legalize, regulate, um, for example, with cannabis, what we've done, um, we've gone too far in the route of commercialization. Here in Edmonton, if I drive down Calgary Trail at every corner, I'm reminded that I can buy cannabis. I'm thankful that I can buy it legally, but I don't need to be reminded every 50 meters that I can buy cannabis. Um, that is the other end of the spectrum. But if we were to, to legally regulate and make substance available with a public health approach based on the harms and the benefits of the substance, then we could, we could cut the dealers totally, all forms of dealers, totally out of the system because your dealer would be like your, your cannabis dealer or something you get at a pharmacy, depending on what the substance is and, and how we regulate it. So that is really where, where Mom Stop the Harm stands. And I shared the Crackdown podcast episode four. I had a chance to be interviewed by, by Garth Mullins, which I've done a lot of interviews in my advocacy, but this one stands out as my favorite interview. And he talked to another family who were in favor of the death penalty and wanting all dealers arrested. And he spoke to that family as well with so much care and compassion. So on that question you know, of the dealers, um, uh, have a listen to that episode and also, um, uh, yeah, I'll post that decrim done right document. Uh, Tala, if there aren't any questions from the audience, maybe the panelists have questions for each other. I know, I know Willie is dying to ask Jamie more questions. Yeah, that was the only question that had come forward. Been some great conversation as we can all see. Um, and just a quick reminder that any resources that have been shared in the uh, chat window, I'll be sending to everyone as a follow-up um, in a follow-up email. So you have all of those links. So don't worry if you haven't been paying attention to it, you will get all of it in a follow-up link or in a follow-up email so that way you can keep, keep up with everything. Uh, just, and I, I do have an additional question for Jamie. Um, I, I noticed uh, you've been posting a lot about uh, law enforcement responding to uh, what appear to maybe be mental health crises um, and your concerns around that. Um, something, a real concern that I share and I think all of us um, share because we know that police often escalate situations that don't need to be escalated and in fact could be handled much better. Uh, we have a couple of families in Saskatchewan uh, whose children recently uh, 
you know, uh, got themselves in a situation where they uh, got shot by police. So um, I, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that. Sure, thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, so I guess like, so because of like decades of, of austerity and cuts to our social welfare system and healthcare system, in the context of deinstitutionalization, so people who were formerly just thrown in and abandoned in psychiatric institutions, um, moving moving them into, um, but not providing sufficient housing, not providing sufficient income, not providing su sufficient community-based services, that has led to progressively police being the um, the, the service provider for people with mental health issues in our communities, as well as people with other sorts of issues, um, including people who over, overdose, for, for example. And more and more, um, you're seeing police get involved in all sorts of healthcare domains, including being parts of like ACT teams, so sort of community treatment teams, and um, forming their own mental health units um, or kind of mental health plans that normalize their involvement in these, in, so normalize that they respond to overdose calls, even though there's no, no, no crime, no violence or anything like that, or normalize that they respond um, to people who are in different forms of crisis. And um, I think it's really the, the calls for this to end really escalated after, after George Floyd um, was murdered. And more and more we've seen in Canada, you know, all sorts of tragic outcomes resulting from police involvement and escalating, as you mentioned, really uh, escalating situations because they don't, they're not appropriately equipped or, or, or trained to, to handle those situations. So part of my work is, is to kind of raise awareness of these alt alternative programs that respond to crises, respond to people who, are, who overdose, respond to homelessness and all sorts of other sort of social, social types of issues without, without needing the police. We, we, we actually never need the police. Maybe rare situations where there, there may be some violence, um, like serious violence where the police may have a security measure, but that's really the exception rather than the rule. And most communities use police as the default response to mental health calls. And in instances where I've had to call for, for overdose, the police routinely come before the ambulance comes in ways that are um, really unnecessary and just kind of promote this criminalization. It's good we have these Good Samaritan laws and things like that. However, um, and those are really important, as was mentioned from a previous speaker, to, um, to save lives. However, one of the things that stops people calling is the fear of police being involved um, and the uncertainty of police being involved. So this is how kind of criminalization in relation to police being embedded in all these processes contributes to, to people not seeking help. And, and that uh, is, includes people who use drugs, but it really includes people who belong to communities who have uh, histories of being traumatized by the police. So black communities, racialized communities, indigenous communities, as well as people who've been traumatized by police. Um, so people's access to care, including crisis response, should not um, be uh, dependent on their feelings about the police or their, their histories uh, with the police. And so that's, I think that's an important piece to this as well as trying to like think through how we entangle criminal justice institutions, including the police, but also things like courts, like drug courts and drug treatment courts, um, and how we kind of like being very skeptical of promoting the, the introduction of criminal justice institutions into the lives of people who have substance use issues, people who use drugs, people with mental health issues, because that kind of invites coercive involuntary forms of care that denies people's rights. And, and the research um, bears out that it's actually not very helpful and supportive for people. 
Um, I understand there was a previous comment about jail being a safe place, you know, being seen as a safe place for a loved one. And I totally understand that. And I think Petra's point around that's because the context is that we're so neglectful in terms of meeting people's needs without having to call police. Um, so wouldn't it be wonderful if there was another option? without having to call police and wouldn't it be yeah, there, a there, is, there is some research around that that actually shows and it's going to be in the links that you get that uh shows that isn't true the incidence of uh of great harm to people who are incarcerated is actually much higher than the general population um so you know I, I understand I was the parent who thought she could sleep too but it didn't take me very long to find out that my daughter was in a lot more trouble in jail than she had been out so so anyway thank thank you for that Jamie yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, uh, to all the panelists for these um, for these wonderful questions. Um, and um, just uh, to wrap us up, uh, either Angela or uh, uh, Tyler, if you could pop what uh, what you and Thompson wrote, his thoughts on support, don't punish. Um, we have that in a blog post uh, with Mom Stop the Harm, and that's that's really powerful. Um, and I also want to thank our organizing committee. Um, uh, Willie, Willie popped this idea. We, we have this habit and mom stop the harm, you know, that something is coming up. Oh, support don't punish us in 10 days. Um, so thanks Willie for nudging us along, making sure we have an event for this really, really important support don't punish is an international movement. You have um, some links in there. You can post a picture of yourself in social media and tag it. Um, it's, it's a really, really important international movement Movement because the criminalization of people who use drugs is far worse in many countries. Um, in most countries, it's sadly far worse than it is even here. Um, like in the US, you can go into jail for life pretty much for, for three drug offenses. Um, in other countries, you get, you get killed or you get shot on the spot in the Philippines. So it's an international movement. It's really important. So please participate in Support Don't Punish. Um, uh, others who helped us organize today, um, um, of course, uh, Tyler was organizing technical assistance. Uh, Angela is um, um, our whiz behind the scene who even manages to live tweet as we go along. And of course, our speaker, sadly, Lucien, his battery went out of power on the phone technology. And um, then we, we had Willie, of course, M Michelle and, and Marie, we kind of wanted to go across the country as well, which is good. And um, so last uh, uh, 64 gifts donated us uh, some, uh, donated some wonderful t-shirts to us and we'll be drawing three. And um, um, afterwards, um, um, yeah, Tyler will, will draw names for three people. And I hope you all have a, have a wonderful Saturday and, and read what um, um, Ewan had to say about his reflections on the war on drugs. So I have actually just posted um, the pictures of the shirts. Um, so hopefully you get a chance to see. Uh, so if your name is drawn, then you can choose as to which shirt that you would like. So the three, um, the three Pilaki people today that joined us um, to receive a t-shirt from 64 Gifts uh, is Daryl Myers, Denise Quinn, and Trish Carter. So I'll be following up with you in an email afterwards, to, uh, specifically in regards to what size and which um, saying that you would like of, uh, for which shirt and confirm an address to be able to get that out to you right away. Thank you for that, Tyler, that, that is great. And just to share a couple of things on what Ewan said. We know policing increases drug harms, but we increase police funding for drug enforcement. We move mountains to find viral vaccine, but we won't push pay, uh, paper to release replacements for contaminated drug, drugs. We ritualize and fetishize alcohol and coffee, but criminalize traditions for opium and cocoa. We train floodlights on crime stats for supervised consumption sites, but we won't hold the candle up to the addiction treatment industry. We shed tears of our unmarked residential school graves as we should but shed responsibility as indigenous people bear the brunt of the drug harms. We embrace harm reduction for sexual education, but we keep pushing abstinence for drug education. We mobilize pharma care to recover the drugs we need, but we stop short of the safe supply needed by others. 
We know people who use drugs fear police, but, but dispatch police to drug poisoning anyway. So there are many more of those statements. So this is in one of our blogs. Um, please share and please go out. Please be safe. Please carry naloxone. Um, we've lost on Bill C216 this time around, but we are not giving up and um, we continue fighting. And, and thank you all for being part of that, that important movement. Yeah. Thank you to our panel. Bye-bye. <laughs> and panelists can stay 